beef farming took a trip to Narok County just before the onset of the April rains in search for successful beef farmers. The county was among the hardest hit by the recent drought, whose effects are still being felt even after the rains began falling a few weeks later. Most livestock and wildlife were at the verge of dying due to lack of pastures and drinking water, with most rivers having dried up to their bare rocky beds, we could literally drive through them. This is the main road that leads to the Masai Mara Game Reserve. We were on our way to meet nominated member of parliament, David Olesan Kok, at his beef farm. Born and brought up in the Maasai pastoralist community in Melili and Toltol sublocation here in Narok, Sankok is among the few successful livestock farmers who've managed to implement new farming techniques which have helped him beat the effects of drought. Of course for a Maasai uh, farming and uh, livestock rearing as a pastoralist, I started at that tender age. In fact from birth, then uh, the first food that you test is uh, cholesterol or uh, this fat from the cow. We are fed with the fat for some time, that is uh, for almost two years. A child of a Maasai, a typical Maasai and a typical pastoralist is fed with uh, cow fat and then uh, later on is weaned into milk, cow milk that is diluted with water and so on. So for me, the issue of pastoralist, I started at a very tender age, at a very young age. And uh, before I went to school, which was a compulsory, or uh, the chief decided that every family must have one child in school, then I was looking after cows. Then at the age of around uh, nine years, around eight years, the chief came and said that one child must go to school. So I was taken to a boarding school under the sponsorship of Wazungu and so on. Uh, so livestock for me, farming uh, started at a very young age. And even before I became disabled, because I became disabled at the age of 12 through a doctor's injection, my ambition was not only looking after cows, but also becoming a Moran and raiding other communities to enlarge our stock, because that is a life of a pastoralist. Cattle rustling is uh, an integral system in uh, pastoralism and raiding other communities is a tradition of the pastoralists. So my ambition was actually raiding, then I became disabled. That was the only time that then uh, some, uh, because of disability, then it changed a bit. Uh, my ambition changed a bit, I had now to study. That is why I'm educated. But this is my passion, I love it. And uh, you see when we are here, I'm quite relaxed and I'm quite at home. Indeed, at home he is. Accompanied by his wife, Harding comes naturally to him as he drives his healthy fat cows to graze. Most pastoralists in the area are yet to engage in some of the modern methods of beef farming. Some of these methods include crossbreeding the traditional Maasai breeds such as the Zebu with the more superior breeds like the Sahiwa and Baran. This ensures a more superior animal that is hardy to the harsh environment and at the same time has improved production. First of all, uh, for a long time we had uh, those uh, traditional cows of ours that did not fetch enough money and uh, milk production was too low. You can uh, get a cow that uh, can only produce maybe not even half a litre of milk per day. So you have to uh, milk so many cows to get even two litres, five litres. So with uh, us who were educated, we are trying to educate the community to change and to adapt the new ways of uh, uh, cows rearing. One of them is uh, by making sure that we have uh, done uh, fencing in our land. You have seen this, this land is quite fenced and that uh, there is paddocking. Uh, we, have, we no longer also depend on uh, rivers, we have uh, dams, 
uh, to make sure that our cows have enough water so that we don't migrate from point A to point B in search of uh, pastures. And once you fence, this pasture will be enough and also we no longer overgraze. It was only last uh, week that I sold almost uh, 30 of them, uh, the ones that we normally buy during a drought and uh, when they are, we fatten them within uh, three months and then we sell them. So uh, uh, we don't overgraze. We make sure that we put or uh, we rear the cows that are able to withstand the, the acreage that you have. And again, if you see, we have a mixture of uh, uh, sywall, which are very good in terms of meat production. They fetch a lot of money. Some of them goes as high as 150,000. The cheapest maybe here is 80,000. And then we also have uh, the dairy cows, which are also integrated here. You have seen the Frisians and the Asia. Uh, and most of them we are crossbreeding so that we come up with a superior breed that will withstand this weather, can also survive. Because when it comes also to zero grazing, to really educate a master on how to do zero grazing will take a lot of time. And also take a toll on them because it, it is demanding. And in terms of uh, profit margin, if you do zero grazing, you know, feeding a, a cow is not an easy job. It's not like feeding your kid. This, this thing eat uh, almost 12 hours. Eating. And you know the mouth is not like yours. You, you eat only for 20 minutes, you wait another lunch time, you eat another 20 minutes, and so on. This thing feed 12 hours continuously. Even at night, they are now uh, do, uh, bring back the cats to digest or to, to, to to, to, to chew again, they chew cards. This, this thing you can, in fact, those who are feeding, I congratulate them. But if you find feeding a cow, even if it produce the number of liters, the profit margin will be very less. But uh, when you have them uh, free range, the Maasai know free range, so already there are specialists there. And again, uh, free range, the profit margin is just too high because what you pay is maybe the shepherd who will only be looking after them. And having paddocking, you can put a large uh, stock without necessarily having a large human force. Paddocking is essential in pasture management. At David Olesan Cox Ranch, which is about 500 acres, this practice has enabled him to have enough grass that can last his cattle for the rest of the year if the rains failed. Despite the scorching sun, Grass at the ranch is knee-high awaiting grazing. This modern pastoralist has created a rotational grazing schedule that seems to work quite well. Compared to neighboring ranches where paddocking is in practice, it is evident that these new techniques, if embraced by all pastoral farmers, will revolutionize this venture. One thing about uh, this uh, free range, where cows don't move, really they are like enclosed, yeah? There is a, we have fenced the whole land, so cows cannot get out. So the shepherds are actually just for the purposes of milking, taking them home at, uh, during the evening and making sure that they are out of the boma uh, in the morning. And again, uh, these grass that are here are controlled, so there is no wild animals or uh, neighbors, uh, livestock that can come. So we can easily control grazing. We can also control within our own uh, livestock by paddocking, so that they graze in one area, uh, while the other one is uh, the grass are growing. Once uh, they finish in one area, they come to the other one and leave the other one uh, to, to also uh, regain again uh, the grass cover. So this issue of paddocking is very important and I advise all uh, livestock farmers, not just to graze just anyhow. Let us paddock and control uh, the grazing. If your land can hold approximately 100 cows, make sure that you only have those 100 cows. Uh, for us, it's around 150. Again, it's an acreage of uh, 500 so we still maintain up to a level of 200 from 200 then we will be m making sure that we sell every now and then when there is an increase we we cull and um, you see also the advantage of this uh, this grass is like uh, hay it's dry it's like hay but if I had to do through grazing that means I'll have to hire a tractor to cut this grass that's money I'll have uh, to hire another one that will tie the grass that's money I also have to hire a lorry that will uh, take them to where the cows are. That is money. I'll also hire a, a human resource, labor force of human beings to carry the hay to the lorry because the lorry cannot uh, load itself and offload itself. That is still money. And that in increase the production uh, rate. But now the cows have teeth. 
they were given by God. So let them cut the hay for themselves. And you know they will be only cutting enough for that day. And then tomorrow they cut enough for that day. And while the hay is still here on the ground, it means it is still growing because it's still alive. So as they cut, the grass still grow. But when you have hay in the store, they will never increase in value. They will never increase in quality. They, they maintain if it is 100 bales, they will remain to be 100 bales. But while they are still alive on the fields, that means if there were 100 bales, by the time the cows are through even grazing, they are already 200 bales. And they, and they use their teeth instead of me using a tractor and paying a lot of money. Uh, God gave them teeth and very sharp teeth for that matter. And they only take what they want. But for the tractor, there is a lot of wastage in terms of. Uh, when they are tying them, there is a lot of wastage. While people are loading, there is a possibility of even others stealing. You know, there are all those... Uh, and if you minimize your production cost, then your profit margin will be higher. Sankok feels that livestock farming, more so the beef market, has and is still lagging behind, despite the efforts being put in by farmers. He says that there is need for government and concerned stakeholders to develop more awareness on meat consumption patterns, preferences and concerns. Nowadays, the pastoralist community have joined into an economic social block. Economic, social, political block, all of them put together in the name of Wafugaji. We no longer have Maasai, Turkana, Pokot, Somali, Borana. We only have one name called Wafugaji. And I'm going all around to try and advise Wafugaji because uh, what have uh, made us uh, lack behind was the session paper of 1965 in Kenya, session paper number 10 of 1965, where they said that uh, uh, they will invest uh, Kenyan taxes in high potential areas. And at that time, their thinking of high potential area meant that uh, it was only the issue of agriculture, production of skumawiki, cabbages, and other things. They forgot that livestock is also another high potential. Oil in Trukana is high potential. Wind power in uh, Loyangala and Marsabit is high potential. Uh, geothermal electric power in uh, Suswa is high potential. The tourists that is done into the live, uh, pastoralist community is high potential. That is why in Kenya we have lagged behind. I, am, I believe we will be with the Asian Tigers if we say that let us invest our taxes across the whole country instead of describing uh, as high potential and low potential. And even they were thinking, they thought uh, pro agriculture is high potential. No country have ever become rich because of production of skumawiki. Countries become rich because of oil in Turkana. Wind power, electric, uh, geothermal electric power. A lot of money have gone to Uganda because of uh, hydroelectric power from Jinja. We will have saved a lot of that taxes and, and constructed a lot of roads, uh, courtesy of... Uh, if we will also have invested on uh, livestock, then we will be one of the greatest exporters uh, of uh, meat and animal byproduct. But because of that uh, session paper, retrogressive session paper of 1965, session paper number 10, that is why uh, we are still behind. We are going to take a break now, but when we come back, we are going to learn more on what other techniques pastoralist farmers can implement to mitigate the effects of drought.